says that she loves me Isn't it lovely when the one who loves me is the one who loves me? I'm going to read a little passage. This is chapter nine. On Monday, January 9th, 1837, John Quincy Adams took to the floor of the Capitol to decry the evils of slavery before his fellow members of the House of Representatives. The Southerners in the room tried to shout him down as the former president, now nearly 70 years old, presented a petition signed by 228 women in Massachusetts. Ignoring the outcry, he pressed on reading from the document which assailed the, quote, simple simpleness of slavery and urged Congress immediately to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia and to declare every human being free who sets foot upon its soil. Now, this book chronicles the 272, but it's also an indictment on this institution of enslavement, which I feel like uh, we're still living through the vestiges of. Actually, I know that, and I think she'll agree, too. Let me welcome the author of this book. Uh, the subtitle is The Families Who Were Enslaved and Sold to Build the American Catholic Church. What? Let me welcome Rachel L. Swarns to the Karen Hunter Show. Hi. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you for, first of all, your uh, brother-in-law traveled to Chicago and handed me this book and said, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I will have to shout out to him. He's yes. an amazing, amazing human being. Uh, I actually worked with your husband for a brief time at the New York That's Daily News. Right. Uh, and you're New York Times and y'all are out there, you know, telling us the things we need to know. So it's an honor to have you. Oh, it's great to be here. The impetus uh, for you writing the 272, and I, I feel like there's like so many nuggets of history that we miss because this country uh, is obsessed with just telling one kind of story. Um, and as I'm reading this book, I was reminded of being in um, Ghana in the Almina, uh, what they call the castles, the dungeons, the death camp. And there's a place where they take you above the carnage. So it's just like a space where the women are packed in to the point where their, you know, bodies are rubbing up against this, this, the walls underneath. And then every day they went upstairs and prayed while they raped and brutalized people right below. And I just think about the hypocrisy of this country, you know, what did, what, drove you to write this book and how does that play out in it? You know, well, the image, that image you just laid out for us is so powerful. And it, it reminds me of something that I always like to tell people when I'm introducing the book, which is a scene that gives you a sense of um, why I did this work and why it matters. And it's the answers the question, who are the 272? And to talk about that, I need to bring everyone back to November of 1838 to the docks of Alexandria, Virginia, not far from the nation's capital. And if you had been standing there that day, you would have seen them, scores of people being loaded onto a ship, forcibly loaded. There were elderly people, husbands and wives, children, babies, you would have seen the crush of the crowd, parents clinging to their kids, babies wailing. These were enslaved African-Americans who had been sold and were about to be shipped down south, far from the world they knew and the people they loved. And they had been enslaved and sold by some of the nation's most powerful Catholic priests who happened to be among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. And when times got tough, these priests did what a lot of people did in 1838, which was to sell off their assets. In this case, human property, 272 men, women, and children to save their prize mission project, the college we now know as Georgetown University, which is the first Catholic institution of higher learning. And when I heard about this, I thought, Catholic priests? Catholic priests enslaved and sold people? Like, how did I not know about that? And Catholic priests relied on slavery to build and expand the church? I, I wanted to know about this history, and I wanted to tell the story of these families. I picked that particular passage because of the 228 women. I want to talk about that as well. The 272, the families who were enslaved and sold to build the American Catholic Church. First of all, let me thank you as well for bringing life to the 272 because they deserve that. 
But when when you you talking right now, I'm like stunned at the again the hypocrisy that you are a priest, meaning you 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 read about Jesus and the Beatitudes, like it's all in the Bible. It's all <laughs> like there. It's the Jesus part. This is, yes, this is your, this is, <laughs> right, right. It's Make, all there. How did they reconcile with owning human beings? It's such a good question. You know, they, you know, what's interesting about these priests is that they, unlike some white people, some white people viewed black people and slave black people as brutes, as like animals. These priests did not. They viewed them as human beings with souls and, and souls that required the priest to tend to them, like souls that needed nurturing at the same time that they bought and sold their bodies. And they pointed to the Bible. St. Paul talks about slaves and masters and their responsibility to each other. But what's important to know is that there were priests all along the way who raised concerns, questions, you know, who said, you know, this is not right. Okay. So who were the 272 that were... So oh. these, yeah, so I, these were families who were sold to, enslaved and sold to build the Catholic church. And I tell the story of one family. I start with the matriarch, a woman by the name of Anne Joyce, who came to Maryland as an indentured servant in the 1600s, um, had a term of labor. She was going to work and then she was going to be a free person. She's forced into slavery. Her contract is burned. She loses everything. But she has her story and she tells that to anyone who would listen. Our liberty was stolen. We should be free people. And she tells her descendants that and they tell their descendants and, and those folks resist. She has descendants who killed an overseer and are executed. She has descendants who file a lawsuit against the priests, you know, taking the priests to court to get their freedom. Um, a handful get their freedom that way, but most don't. And then what do you do? Well, one of her descendants, a man by the name of Harry Mahoney, um, saves the church's wealth in the War of 1812. And the priests reward him, say, you know, you, you'll never be sold. Your family will never be sold. But that that promise is broken in 1838 in that mess. They lied, Rachel. They lied. The priests <laughs> lied. What's really important, too, what I want people to know is that, you know, these days, there's a lot of talk about, oh, we don't need to talk about slavery, right? It has nothing to do with us. Don't teach it. Don't talk about it. Um, long time ago, irrelevant. And what people really need to know is that it is foundational, I, foundational. And so for the church, the Catholic church, priests who relied on slavery built the first archdiocese. They built the first cathedral, uh, the first Catholic institution of higher learning, Georgetown. Priests who operated and ran a plantation and sold people built the nation's first Catholic seminary. This was foundational. Uh, this is, is stunning. 866-801-8255. Rachel L. Swarns is here. The book is the 272, the families who were enslaved and sold to build the American Catholic Church. I'm wondering how many of you are Catholics? 866-801-8255. And what is your responsibility as a Catholic to hold the Catholic Church accountable, not just for the pedophile ring that they have been presided over for decades, but this, this history of slavery as everyone's coming to reckoning from Brown University on, you know, people are saying, okay, we have a responsibility to you know, reparations as Brown is setting aside, you know, scholarships to people who were impacted by enslavement. Um, how did you find the 272? How did you find this family? So, you know, a colleague of mine um, got an email from a Georgetown alum, you know, who wanted to pitch the New York Times story. I was a correspondent at the Times. And he said, got a great story about 1838 slave sale in Georgetown. And she was, she was, intrigued, but uncertain. Like, was that even a story? And um, it's my great fortune that she didn't delete the email, but she remembered I had written a book, uh, American Tapestry, about Michelle Obama and her enslaved ancestors. And she said, hey, maybe she might know. And I got that email and, and I knew. And like I said, I was astounded. I happen to be Black and Catholic myself. So this has been quite a journey. Um, and it was history that I just did not know. Now, I'm I'm having a reckoning with forced religion and I and I consider Catholicism on so many levels it like it 
and I'm going to say this out loud. It makes no sense. Um, I went to Catholic school, uh, high school, um, all throughout high school and gr- grade school uh, from the fifth grade on. And from the Stations of the Cross to calling men father, which it clearly stays in the Bible, call no man father. I was like, this is a contradiction to my Bible. I can't call you father. So I I, I, I struggle with it, um, which, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in trouble because it didn't make sense. And I would ask questions uh, of these folk. And who told you to marry G- Jesus? Why are you a nun? Like, I would just have questions. I just had, always had questions. Yeah, yeah. Is it our responsibility, those of us, because I, you know, I, I have a special relationship with the Lord <laughs> to question and challenge these systems that actually not just indoctrinate us, but enslave us in so many ways, right? So if you are a black Catholic, which you are. I wish I am. Your family is, right? So how do you reconcile personally, Rachel, with with the foundation of this? And and we're not even going to go to the council of not, you know, we're not even going back Mm -hmm. to Rome and the Vatican and why the Vatican is the Vatican and how these popes have, you know, and what what the money is. is Yeah, yeah, because the Vatican is one of the wealthiest cities in the world, right? (laughs) So, you know, you know, it's really interesting. And, you know, first of all, questions, I think I'm a journalist, so I'm a firm believer in questions. And so when I found this out, which, you know, I had no idea. One of the first questions I asked myself was, why did why didn't I know? Why why didn't I know? Why why isn't this history? We we as Americans think of, you know, the Catholic Church as a northern church, as an immigrant church. Why, why is it that I didn't know about this history of enslavement that was foundational to the emergence of, of the church? And the truth is that enslaved people have been left out of the story that is told about how the origin story of the Catholic church in this country. And I ask myself, why? Um, you know, and I think it's as as we learn more, and I, I consider myself a reasonably educated person. Again, I'm Catholic myself. Um, why don't we know? And I think um, as as anyone who digs into history, um, especially the history of slavery, I think, you know, there are a lot of stories that people would prefer not to tell, um, a lot of narratives that um, people would prefer not to be heard. Um, and, and I think this has been one of them. I should say that Georgetown and the Jesuit priests who were involved in this history have taken steps to address it. Um, and there's a whole descendant community now, descendants of these people who have been pushing the the church, pushing Georgetown to make amends. Um, Georgetown has created a $400,000 a year fund that they're raising money for projects to benefit descendant communities. Um, The Jesuit priests partnered with a group of descendants uh, created a foundation, promised to raise a hundred million dollars to benefit descendant projects and racial reconciliation projects. That agreement marked the largest effort by the Roman Catholic Church to address this history. But as you point out, Karen, some people, some descendants are dissatisfied with that. They asked for a billion dollar foundation. Um, they're saying the church has more money than that. Why are they raising money when they have money? And the truth is even the fundraising has been slower um, than even um, Jesuits who have been pushing for this kind of reckoning had hoped. Um, So these these institutions um, are trying to grapple with it. Um, Like I said, people have mixed feelings about it, but it's coming at a time when there are all kinds of um, institutions, you know, not just Georgetown, not just the Catholic Church, We're talking about Harvard, right? Not just universities, not just religious organizations. We're talking about Evanston, Illinois, municipalities, Asheville, North Carolina, the state of California, right? So there's a lot of um, uh, steps being taken, um, but there are also these headwinds, you know, people trying to stop this kind of thing from happening. So we're in a complicated time. Complicated even more by the rejection of actual history yes by by the climate of ignorance you know and it's super frustrating I'm, and i ha- i'm not afraid of much but i'm afraid that we're too ignorant like it's like the ignorance level is so high that it's almost impossible to fight i'm gonna keep yeah. fighting but i feel i feel 
defeated a lot because you're you're arguing and having discussions with people who don't have the capacity to even want to know to be just right. remotely curious and i want to just praise you for a second rachel swarns because you know you still are a catholic that you still are a catholic which tells me that we all have the capacity to examine the things that we believe hold them accountable criticize them and still have faith in the things we have faith in. Like it, it's not, you know, either or. So we can right. confront racism, white people. It doesn't mean <laughs> that you, you know, like I'm, I'm juxtaposing it to that because it's yeah. like, yeah, come, come with it. Let's, yeah. let's have an examination. And it's, and it's, and it's this one, this, this idea that for instance, you know, you're un-American if you raise these kinds of questions, it's you're un-American if you look closely at our history and, you know, and, and these enormous problems that we've had, it's, it's not un-American. That's, that's who we are. We, we have to, if, if we, if we believe in these ideals, we have to be true to them. And one of the interesting things, um, you know, writing about these families who were enslaved and betrayed by the church is that a lot of them remained Catholic, even after the civil war. And many of them became lay leaders. Some even became religious leaders. And what they did was push the church to be more reflective of and responsive to black Catholics and and also to the ideals that they espoused of universality, right? Um, So they really pushed the church and, you know, as a black Catholic, that that was inspiring to me. And and you still hold on to being a Catholic. Why? I'm just <laughs> I know. Rachel people Swarns sometimes, is here. It's okay, Karen. Sometimes people want to grab me by the shoulders and say, what are you doing? No, no, I don't. I don't. I I, I, I want, no, I, I, I like, listen, I want everyone to, to, to be free to be all of the things. Cause you, right. you you're not sitting there ignorant of no, these things. And no. so, yeah. so, you know, I, so, I think yeah, there's instruction you know, here. Yeah, no, I think for me, it's, you know, I, I grew up in the, tr- you know, my mother is, uh, her family, or my grandmother, my mother, this is my mother's side, um, is Catholic. Um, they were really tied to Catholic New York. They lived on a farm that was run by Dorothy Day, um, who is now a candidate for the sainthood, very tied to Catholic New York. And, um, you know, it's it's the place where I feel home. It's the place where I, the ritual, um, you know, I got my rosary beads. I, I, I don't know, what can I tell you? And, um, you know, I'm digging into the archives. I'm looking at these inventories, reading about these priests um, and, you know, thinking to myself, good, you know, this is, this is the history, right? This is the history. Um, But like I said, I'm inspired by the, the families who pushed the church, the black families who pushed the church and also by those priests, those lonely voices who said no, you know, and there are people who today will say, if you are someone like me who is investigating the history of slavery in America, don't bring your 21st century moral ideas to this. It was legal. It has nothing to do with them. And and in this story, I can tell you that that simply isn't the case. There were priests who knew and who raised questions, who protested. One of the priests who I write about try to persuade the higher ups not to sell, had everyone praying about it. And when that didn't work, when the slave traders were coming, he told the enslaved people to run. And so I think it's, I don't know, what can I tell you? It's, 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 it's a church that um, feels uh, home to me, um, but also one I think that has to look at its history. And I'm, I'm, that's the work that I'm doing. And I just, uh, again, I want, I want people to, to be free, mm-hmm. you know, freedom is, is the goal. Yeah. So, you know, it's not a finger wag. It's like, <laughs> if we can, if we can examine everything about the things that we believe and still arrive, which is why I'm always constantly poking a finger in, at Christianity and, you know, the things I was raised with and still believe there's yeah. something even more powerful about that. I always say my God is big enough that I don't, my God doesn't need to be defended by me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to go out and, you know, shout people down about what they believe, you know, because this belief is personal and we should have the freedom to arrive at a place, but do so with examination, with understanding. Open eyes. 
Yes. Mm-hmm. What, what you're doing and the 272, the families who were enslaved and sold to build the American Catholic Church. Rachel L. Swarns is here is that book. Now, I, I read a passage from chapter nine, the sale, uh, because, you know, John Quincy Adams, the first time I understood his um, abolitionist spirit, which is complicated, too, was watching the Amistad. I took a young person to go see it because I thought it was so powerful. You know, the the, the and I sat in that theater and was like nobody in there but me and the young person I brought to, to watch it cr- crying because it was so not just liberal, there was something about the spirit of Jamin Hansu picking at that nail, you know, till his finger was bloody. Even though a lot of people focused on the court trial, you know, and give us us free. That story of liberation isn't told enough, but John Quincy Adams' role in fighting for that. Who were the 228 women? So, yeah, and, and that's an important thing, again, to say that, you know, there are these people who raise their voices, right? He He's out, Adams is out of the White House, out of the presidency, you know, he's in Congress. And, and these were women, white women in Massachusetts who are saying this is wrong. Um, and he is delivering these appeals from his constituents saying, look, we've got these women who are saying, you know, we want an end to slavery um, and let's start it right here in the District of Columbia. Um, And, you know, he's being shouted down. And one of the guys who's shouting him down is one of the people who would end up buying um, many of the 272 um, from the Catholic priests who ran Georgetown. What kind of jobs were the 272 doing? You know, jobs, we call them jobs. <laughs> as yeah, but what, what kind of, yeah. So, like, you know, it was a mix. They were enslaved. Um, this sale benefited Georgetown uh, University, which is obviously in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital. But these plantations were in Southern Maryland. And that's really where um, the foundations of the Catholic Church were built. So the, and, and the crops there were primarily tobacco, corn, um, wheat. Um, So there were field laborers, there were blacksmiths, um, carpenters, um, you know, house staff, all all, the whole range. And and what was terrifying to them was that they were going to be shipped to Louisiana, which, you know, with a brutal sugarcane um, cotton fields. Um, and you know the priests, the 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 senior priests who were organizing this knew this, and that their families were going to be torn apart. Mm. I think about the things done when nobody's there. If the priests were doing things to children in this current iteration, imagine with no police, nobody there to watch over. I, I just imagine some horrors being done on these plantations, but I digress. 866-801-8255. Did you uncover any of that? Right. Yeah, I mean, there were reports of people, you know, talking about the 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 conditions that people lived in um, in the 1820s. You know, there are reports that were written about the deplorable housing conditions, the fact that they were given food that was inadequate and sometimes rancid. Um, you know, they had to, uh, you know, <laughs> basically say that you cannot hold pregnant women in the, you know, priest home and whip them. I mean, so, you know, there were things going on that shouldn't have been going on. All right. I'm going to take Keith. Keith, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, Keith in North Carolina. Welcome to the Karen Hunter show. You're on with Rachel Swarns. The 272 is the book. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good. Okay. Now we might have reasons why Ron DeSantis or Ron DeSatan might not want CRT talk. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Ron DeSatan is a Catholic himself, and that might be kind of close to home to him. Nah, uh, I don't think he knows this history. Like, so I'm I'm not even going to add that to the equation. And this and 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 the the ban of books and and CRT and all of that doesn't stop us from getting these books and reading them. They're available for all of us. You know, you can say you don't want this taught in school. That's fine. But as a parent or as a person that is in a child's life or in a person's life, you can recommend these books. You can read these books. They're readily available. Not, there's a ban on books only because we don't pick them up and read them. They, they can dictate what's in schools. But hell, I didn't grow up in a school system because I went to Catholic schools that taught me anything about being black. I had to learn that at home with, with parents that had books and everything. So yeah, I'm as black as I am because my home was black 
<laughs> and didn't matter what school I went to. So we got to be more vigilant. Do you agree with that, Rachel? And I thank think you, that's, Keith. Such a, that's such a good point because I think, you know, we do, have, this is work that we do have to do. Our, so we can't, we can't count, Lord, Lord knows with what's going on now, we can't count on others to do it. And and it's urgent. Like we we have to be educated about this. We have to know this history. Um, and um, I, I had parents like you, Karen, who who made sure that we knew as much as 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 they as they could bring to us. It's it's really important. Well, let's have you back. Let's keep having these conversations. Let's have you back talk about Michelle Obama too. Oh, I'd I'd love think, to do yes. that. Yes, yes, you you got you have an open seat here. Uh, professor at NYU, she teaches journalism, contributing writer for the New York Times. And the latest book, The 272, is fire. It's powerful. The families who were enslaved and sold to build the American Catholic Church. Rachel Swarns, nice to meet you in person. Thank you for coming in today. Oh, thank you so much. Good luck, can't turn my back on that. Gotta make moves, gotta act on that. You're the one I want and I stand on that. You and me, babe, that's black on black